going to walk you through our process for assessing third-party tools from cradle to grave. And we are, in my case, uh, I am, uh, Bob Squilache. Uh, I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Liberal Studies at New York University, but more importantly for this session, I co-chair and have for some time the user advisory group that's part of the LMS management um, or DLE management uh, uh, process at NYU. Hi, and I'm Jeff Pash. I'm the product director for our instance of Sakai at NYU, and I work closely with Bob and the governance groups as well as with this, the wonderful Sakai community. Okay, so first a little background. Um, so in the beginning, there was the LMS. So what, early 2000s or something? I don't know. You know what that is. We all, we've seen that may, a few times, maybe too many. Uh, and the LMS was all into itself, and the integration of tools was unknown in the land, and it was not good. But lo, there was LTI, and LTI was good. However, along with LTI came a host of questions and issues. This is the story, likely one of the greatest ever told on a Tuesday, of how we address them, where we find ourselves now, and what might come next. So at NYU, we have a number of tools integrated with Sakai. Um, some of these are LTI integrations. Uh, a few of them are custom integrations, but here you can see a quick list of those and, and more on the way. It's a, uh, it's a constant um, sort of process, integrating these tools and then eventually decommissioning um, so we're going to talk about what, you know, how we got to this point. So this is, you know, after a couple years of integrating tools, what that process looks like and what some of the processes, um, you know, we've put around that are. So like any story, ours unfolded in chapters. It didn't all happen at once. It didn't all happen in a neat way. Uh, we would solve one problem and immediately learn that there were three other problems that uh, spoke off of that uh, initial one, or, or challenges, uh, if one doesn't want to call them problems. Where we started was developing an intake process for feature requests. We were getting faculty members, we were getting units saying, I want to use VoiceThread, we want to try Serigo, we want to use this or that third party uh, uh, piece of software. So we needed to think about, well, how do we decide whether we are going to integrate these or not. Uh, in the wake of that process, we developed, and I'll give you more detail on all of these as we go along, probably more detail than you'd ever want to know, uh, a vendor information questionnaire to try to get beyond what vendors will tell you in the demo, which is never sufficient really for making a decision. As a result of doing a number of analyses of individual feature requests, we realized that we were doing something that was a little bit too tool-based and not needs-based enough and developed a different method of exploring the landscape around a certain need to, in order to look at the tools that might need that need in a more synoptic fashion rather than dealing ad hoc with each faculty request as it came in. That, however, is a big enterprise-oriented uh, process. We also needed to think about how we can allow innovative faculty members who want to use a, a particular tool that may not need broader support or adoption, uh, how we would handle that process as well. And then we come to the, uh, the final chapter in our story, which is our pilot benchmarking process. How do we decide when we've run a pilot of a third party tool, whether it's been successful or not, and what we do next with it? The magic swipe, it will only listen to his finger. So I start with our uh, request intake process for the LMS. I'm not going to go through all of the bullets uh, or all of the 
uh, slides uh, in this chart, it looks, you know, on the surface of it like uh, the plan for developing the Manhattan Project. It's actually a lot simpler than it looks. Essentially, when a request comes in from whatever, uh, whatever source it might be, whether it's from an individual user, whether it's from an academic unit, whether it's from a dean, it goes through a process where it essentially needs to uh, go through three uh, uh, challenges before it can be adopted. Uh, the first is a technical review. There's no point in anybody else looking at the functionality until we know whether we can integrate it, whether it's secure, whether it meets FERPA and, uh, and compliance standards. So technical review comes first. After that happens, it goes to our user advisory group. Uh, the reason we have it go to the user advisory group is to see if it is a very limited sort of need or something that actually a lot of other um, units around the university might want to take advantage of. Uh, for instance, the need for uh, being able to take attendance came to us from one particular unit, but then everybody in the user advisory committee said, wow, we need to take attendance too. So we realized there was a much bigger push uh, behind that and, and due to some uh, confluence of the stars that we still don't entirely understand. The University of Dayton developed a very nice attendance tool for Sakai just at that, at that particular moment. After it goes to the user advisory group, which is a recommendatory group. It's made of users. It doesn't always have the, the expertise, and it certainly doesn't have the budget authority to say whether or not a tool should be adopted. Its recommendation goes to our Digital Learning Environment Committee, which used to be called the LMS committee. It's just still got the old name on this chart showing how recently we, uh, we made the change. Oh, that some of the chart has DLE and some has, has LMS. Uh, anyway, uh, and the Digital Learning uh, Environment Committee, which is composed of uh, people in uh, uh, ed tech uh, positions of responsibility in each of the different schools and units of NYU makes a final call on whether to adopt the tool as a pilot or not. That process uh, has had some advantages and some disadvantages. First of all, it's coherent. Just the fact that it is a process, that it's not dealing with the request on an ad hoc basis with some particular person in IT saying, Yes, that sounds like a good idea. No, that doesn't sound like a good idea. That's easy. That's not easy. Uh, gives some uh, coherence to what we're doing. It also has the advantage that it can uh, sort out requests from uh, dividing the ones that are of wider interest from the ones that are of more specialized interest. It does, however, have a couple of disadvantages, the primary one being uh, as I mentioned more briefly earlier, it's very tool-based. It's not need-based. And you don't want to put yourself in a position where you adopt VoiceThread as a discussion forum tool and then find out that there are five better discussion tools on the market. Nothing against VoiceThread. I'm using that as a hypothetical uh, example. Um, you don't want to find out that there are five better tools on the market. You really want to be looking at the need around, say, discussion tools more broadly. Uh, and the other problem at this point was that when we looked at an individual tool, we tended to get a demo from the, uh, from the company that, uh, from the vendor that was making that tool that made it sound like the key to all mythologies, the thing that was going to unlock every, uh, every problem with technology that you were ever having, and students would practically teach themselves with it. That led us to develop. a very extensive vendor information form that we ask each vendor uh, to fill out. And we have an example of one that has been filled out by uh, the vendor uh, task stream in connection with their Aqua product. This asks a series of questions that situate the tool in a larger landscape 
Is it only used for higher ed or is it used outside higher ed? Uh, is it a, a tool that um, has been uh, uh, successfully implemented at other universities? What other universities are using it? Uh, does it scale? Uh, how, is it, uh, how is the data hosted? What's shared from it? All of these kinds of information, uh, pieces of information are included on the vendor questionnaire form. Uh, so that uh, when we make a decision about whether to re recommend a tool uh, to the digital learning environment, we're not just basing it on what the vendor has shown us about how the tool works and our enthusiasm about what looks like a great product, but a really deep dive into the, uh, 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 the things that aren't evident from uh, a demo. Uh, you know, can you perform bulk actions with this tool? Uh, there's many a tool that looks wonderful until you try to use it to perform an action with 50 students instead of with one student. Uh, and then you find out, oh, I have to do this same thing 50 times over. This is impossible. I can't really use this. So the vendor information form also has advantages and disadvantages. The primary advantage, as I'm saying, you find out what they don't tell you in the demo. Uh, you get uh, some information in print that you can look over, think, uh, think about more fully, and uh, really have a sense of what the uh, context for the tool is. Disadvantage, it's a very long form. I think there are 14 questions on it. Maybe we're gathering a little bit more information than we can reasonably ourselves digest. There is always uh, a timing problem in that the, uh, the vendor may take longer to get back to you about all of these questions than you really have before you need to, to implement the tool. and we're still thinking about whether the questions we have are entirely the right ones for the audience that needs to make a judgment about the tool. Uh, have we asked the right questions so that users will be able to see whether this is a tool that should or should not be recommended? This is where we were about at the beginning of this uh, academic year, or maybe even this calendar year. Uh, in January, we started thinking about, is doing this kind of tool-based analysis really the best path? And we developed a process for, oops, that's pilot benchmarking. Yeah. So we developed a process around uh, uh, broader needs, where the user advisory group would first try to develop a really granular set of needs around a particular uh, uh, set of requirements around a particular need. In this case, video annotation. We've got faculty in many areas, uh, clinical practice areas, people who teach film, uh, who need to be able to annotate video. So uh, we developed the kind of three-pronged uh, breakdown of needs, three divisions, needs that are immediate, needs that we would have to have within a certain amount of time, and things that it would be nice to have down the road, but they are not necessarily uh, uh, what we need right away. When we went to try to evaluate tools on this basis, we realized it was useful, but it needed a supplement because a, a product may meet all of the needs individually, that doesn't mean it meets use cases where you're using uh, different aspects of the software in combination with each other, uh, where you may be able to do something uh, with uh, a full group that you can't do in a subgroup and you actually need to do it in the subgroup. So to supplement the user needs uh, requirements documents, we, um, working in a much smaller group, the user needs requirement document comes out of a large user advisory group committee. 
the um, use cases are developed by a smaller group, the chairs of the user advisory group and the chairs of our instructional technologist uh, subcommittee. And here we create individual use cases that show some of the ways that people might actually want to use this tool. The instructional technologists then take these two documents in conjunction with each other uh, because they are the ones who are best situated to know the market. They develop a, uh, uh, an analysis of all of the different tools on the market that might meet these needs and show which will fit our use cases, uh, which will not fit our use cases. That recommendation then goes to our digital learning environment committee. This has a, a lot of advantages over a tool-based approach. It's a thorough approach. It's a thoughtful approach. It's not a, a particular professor is really hot to trot for uh, a certain kind of tool and wants us to integrate it uh, within three weeks so that it can use it through uh, our Sakai instance before the finals. Uh, rather, it's thinking about what will really work at an enterprise level? What's something that, that scales to a large number of faculty members, meets a large number of needs? Like any process, it has disadvantages or limitations, perhaps, as well. The primary one being it's slow. Uh, it has a lot of different stages. First, the need has to, has to be identified, and you have to decide, well, do we need an annotation tool or a video annotation tool? Uh, are these separate or are these the same? Uh, are these the same thing? Then you have to develop uh, the requirements document, uh, develop use cases out of that, and have the analysis of the landscape of tools. We did find that it went, a, uh, in theory, this should be a quite uh, glacial process, but in fact, it went a little bit faster than we expected. Uh, we did both video annotation and web conferencing tools this past semester, found that often individual units had already developed sets of user requirements around some of these tools that we could use as a basis for the university-wide uh, document, uh, and that the uh, uh, Instructional Technology Subcommittee because it was composed of people who were very familiar with the uh, broad set of uh, tools that were on the market, uh, could do their analysis a bit more rapidly than we thought. So within about a two, three month period, we were able to do both video annotation tools and, uh, and web conferencing. Don't have a slide for this, which is perhaps uh, appropriate. Uh, as we were moving along later this past semester, I'd say sometime around February or March, uh, a member of our digital learning environment committee said, well, but what about when we need to integrate something fast just to test it out? Uh, and we don't want to just run it as a, as a separate tool. We want to integrate it through the LMS because we're not going to find out otherwise how it will play in actual use. Instructors uh, need to run it through the LMS for it to be practical, for it to have a, a roster that updates dynamically, uh, for it to be part of the space in which, uh, in which they are teaching. What do we do in those cases? This is still somewhat um, nascent. It's, 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 it's jello that hasn't fully set yet. Uh, but I think that what we're looking at here is a lighter, quicker process where, assuming, uh, again, that the tool passes the technical level uh, of review uh, and it's FERPA compliant and an easy LTI integration, the Digital Learning Environment Committee might, without going through those other processes, give it a simple check off and say, okay, if you and the unit want to use it, go ahead, we'll do the integration, but you or the vendor have to support its actual use. It's not going to be supported centrally by, uh, by IT. The advantage of that, this is fast, this is encourage, encourages um, uh, innovation. 
sometimes you can do a small pilot around certain kinds of tools that don't actually need to be integrated with the LMS, but in those cases where you, as a unit, won't really get a sense of uh, how it would possibly scale, if you don't run it through the LMS, uh, uh, you can uh, do it in this way. Uh, an instance of this might be a, uh, a textbook from a particular publisher, an electronic textbook from a particular publisher that one unit wants to use uh, for a required course across 20 or 30 sections that might be an easy LTI integration. Uh, the support is coming from the publisher of the e-text and all that central IT is doing is providing the, uh, the LTI integration, which I think Jeff can speak a little bit more about how quick that can sometimes be. It's a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we rehearsed that. Disadvantages um, have to do, I think, mostly with expectations of faculty members, where if you're implementing a lot of different separate tools, uh, say there's a, a, a forums tool of some sort being uh, offered in small pilots, five or six or eight of them in different units, you're setting yourself up for um, uh, some grief whenever you're going to move uh, to a larger scale uh, kind of uh, kind of tool. When, when if you want something that scales, you really have to have the general conversation. You can't leave it to a, a unit or a department uh, to make a decision. Also, we're finding that this agile process is not exactly an American ninja warrior. It's not so agile as it seems in that the major uh, drags against getting a tool implemented usually aren't the complications of the LTI integration uh, or the uh, analysis of the user needs. There are things like compliance, security, legal issues, uh, not technical sorts of things. Uh, to give an example, for instance, of the publisher's uh, textbook that I was mentioning earlier, we had to go through the Office of General Counsel. You know how fast offices of general counsel uh, or any legal proceeding tends to move in order to determine how we could have this integration without the university being in a position where it was automatically passing directory information that was protected under NYU policy, at least by FERPA, from NYU to the publisher without the student's consent. Students were buying the textbook through, uh, through NYU classes, and we essentially had to give them a back door so they could buy the textbook through a, a different means without their net ID being passed without their consent. Did anybody actually use that back door, or is it more for show? I think it's probably for show. No. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say one other thing about that. So there are, there are Sakai schools who allow instructors to add any LTI tool. So you say add external tool, you plug in the three parameters, and you're off and running. NYU is more risk averse, so we don't allow that. So that's where this conversation comes in, where we say, okay, here's a tool, it passes kind of the minimum, like security, um, FERPA, et cetera, and yes, we can put it in this one course or these two courses um, and move a little faster. So that's kind of the difference. And we've seen the opposite extreme where some schools, they don't want any, <laughs> they don't want any integrations with the LMS or just so few because they're so nervous about that FERPA issue. Oh, first again, okay. Something that we uh, also did this past year, and this we essentially had to invent out of whole cloth. Uh, we don't know if anybody out there has a, uh, a pilot benchmarking process 
in place. If they do, we'd love it if you'd share it with us because we're not you know, entirely confident that we've hit the right method for doing this. But what we decided uh, in this past year was essentially that every pilot should run for a minimum of two semesters so that we can gauge the delta in response through surveys and through usage data between the first and second semester. A, if a tool appears to be taking off, if it's getting more users, if more faculty members are saying, yes, I would recommend this to a colleague, that's more important than what the satisfaction level in a single semester might be for telling whether you want to take this pilot and elevate it to uh, enterprise uh, status. Conversely, if fewer and fewer users are using a tool uh, after each semester, uh, or from first semester to the second, you may decide this is not really going to be worth the uh, budget that we're investing in it if it's a, a licensed tool that you're, uh, that you're paying a fair amount for or the uh, time that we're investing uh, for supporting it. So it's really very case by case. We gather the kind of data that you see here. This was with the University of Dayton's uh, attendance tool, which was quite successful. Uh, faculty, for the most part, were, uh, were really satisfied with the extent to which it, it met their needs. A uh, uh, 4.0 on a, a 1 through 5 scale is, uh, is quite good. Um, so we'll look at this again after the fall and see how those numbers have changed. We've established some targets that we would like to see for the next semester, but after we've gathered that data, it doesn't determine the decision, it informs it. And that decision could be continue it as a pilot, elevate it to enterprise status, uh, get rid of it altogether, have it be something that an individual school can support if it wants to, but it won't have central support. There are a whole range of options that the user advisory group can recommend to the Digital Learning Environment Committee uh, for adoption. So I, I think so far we're happy with this, and uh, in addition to, to surveying users, we thought it would be a good idea to survey the people who support the tool as well. So we've um, surveyed the instructional technologists who are responsible for helping faculty use the tool. And that's been revelatory as well. It was a surprise to us that there were some tools that faculty were a lot more satisfied with than the instructional technologists were. And the instructional technologists felt, yeah, this is great for the faculty member, but it's a pain in the ass for me to, to help them to, uh, uh, to use. And I could really uh, stand something uh, a, a bit simpler. Uh, in some cases, it may just have been uh, that it revealed communication gaps, where we're not communicating to the instructional technologists who are scattered among at NYU among, what, 14 different schools, something like that, exactly what tools have been rolled out and how to use them and what the best practices around them are. So I think the advantages of this system uh, is that uh, measuring the rate of change we feel is going to be the best way to evaluate uh, a pilot and see what direction it's moving in, not just its absolute numbers over a certain uh, period of time, um, and the flexibility of different outcomes we have. The disadvantage is we don't know what we're doing with this yet. We haven't really tried it. Is this going to work? We don't know anybody else who's tried it uh, and really thought, and we're so, it, the integration of third party tools through LTI is new enough that we don't know how other institutions uh, are evaluating the success of their pilots, of their third party tools, whether they're doing it at all, uh, and what, uh, what their results have been. It's hard to get reliable survey data uh, from faculty members. Uh, we have to, I think, do a little bit more to inform them that they are part of a pilot. And if they are using this tool, 
the support we're giving them has a price, which is they have to tell us what they thought about its, uh, uh, its use. Um, and it's always going to be hard to pull the plug on an existing service. And no matter if your benchmarks show that support is evaporating, if that one faculty member who's married to the tool uh, insists that they are married to it forever and happen to be a, a, a full professor with tenure who has a mighty reputation in the academic world, it's going to be hard to say, I'm sorry, we're just not going to support your use of whatever the tool might be uh, anymore. Our conclusions then. One of the things I think that we're seeing is that we need um, this. My background's in, in literary analysis, so I'm always big on semantics. Maybe to think of the uh, metaphor less as an app store than as an app library, where there's really active curation and intervention in the use of the tool rather than simply putting it out there for people to pick and choose uh, what they want. I think um, there are a small number of innovative faculty members, in fact, by our surveys, it seems to be around 14, 15%, who will be really active about finding the latest technology and investing their time in it and using it in their teaching. If we want to reach that other 85%, we have to do it in a more active way because, frankly, teaching is not all that well rewarded, especially in large research institutions. And unless you can show a faculty member that their investment of time is really going to pay off, they're not going to invest that time uh, on their own. So there has to be a way to um, not only to make LTI tools available, but to bring them to faculty members in a way where they will see the advantages and the best practices around using them. Okay. And then the last point, and this came up in the uh, NGDLE talk, um, and that's enabling personalization. So, you know, giving, uh, you know, discipline-specific tools, that was one of the, you know, big, um, one of the big themes that people wanted, you know, discipline specific, math, math science, whatever it is, tools um, to be integrated within uh, the digital learning environment. And that's, that's something we try to do through these pilots. Um, there, are some, um, there are some technical solutions that we've been working on around this. So, for example, um, here's an example of a site. Uh, so WebEx is not one of our default tools. But we've, uh, we've created a framework where we can say, for this school within NYU or this department, we want this tool to be available. So we've, we've developed these rules where you can kind of reveal a tool just to a department, just to a school, a division, or even to just an individual. Instead of having to lo you know, throw it into the left menu, you give them more options of, of what, they, um, what they integrate. So, each school in, in some ways has a different LMS. They have a different set of tools, they have a different set of templates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. Questions? Uh, let's start with uh, David. Can we bring the microphone there? <coughs> So in a um, user experience uh, world where people are looking for, for kind of clean and simple, how do you keep piling on all these tools and, and, and keep, keep the interface clean? Yeah, so I mean, in, in NYU's case, that's New York University. In NYU's case, um, so a lot of these are pilots, they're, they're by request. Um, so we don't give we don't give a thousand options in that add edit tools. Um, so in some cases, those pilot tools are only applicable to one school. So they see one extra box there that they can use. Um, we don't give them every option in the world. So that's a good point. Good question. 
And I think the other uh, angle on that is um, pedagogical uh, sensitivity on the part of instructors and getting instructors to use a tool when there's a very specific need for it and students can understand why they're, uh, why they're using it and why they have to go out into a different environment uh, in order to do GIS mapping or something that's more sophisticated than what you would do uh, within the parameters of the LMS itself. And, and I guess one thing we didn't mention is that in many cases there are schools who are already using the tool. They're using it outside of the LMS. Um, so they're having students sign up with their email addresses. They don't have any agreement with some of these third-party tools. So it's about us sort of pulling them in, um, you know, to the central IT environment and legal and everything else. So a question Adam down here? Uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> it's um, it's Circulive is a third-party vendor, and um, yeah, we can we can chat about that. I was wondering how you take tools from the tool or how you just pay and pay. Yeah, that's that's a, a selective stealthing um, capability we're working on. It's not quite ready for contribution, but we can we can talk about it. Yeah, Laura Geckler. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, would it be possible to get a copy of your guys' vendor questionnaire? Yes. Somebody, somebody. Laura Geckler of the University of Notre Dame. Hi, Jeff Cash of the New York <laughs> University. My question is, in my experience, I run into um, providers of tools that are named LTI tools, and then I discover they're not. Uh, I, I hate that situation, so one of my um, reasons for being in the room was your enticing title, Vendor Bender. I was hoping you were going to provide me tools with bending the vendor to my will. Uh, do you have any hints on that? Blackmail. Um, no, I think... Um, yeah, I think it's it's something that you that you and I have started a bit, but I think there's a lot of potential for folks in the community who are using a certain tool to come together and say, you know, as a group to a vendor, hey, we would like you to improve this integration, this LTI integration, and maybe that's money, but I think in a lot of cases it's just, you know, numbers, um, a number of schools coming at them um, with with a need. Yes. I won't name that tool, but I'll tell you afterwards. I think we also, by foregrounding the technical review for any tool, hope to get at, uh, I say technical, it's not just a question of whether it can be integrated through LTI, but how the LTI integration works, what data is passed back and forth to us, because that, that can be one of the problems. They say it's LTI, but all the data stays with the vendor and none of it comes back to the university or it comes back in a, a form that's totally unusable. Mm -hmm. So we try to get uh, answers to questions like that in advance. Yeah, and we, I, actually we're working with a vendor now um, and you know that, that signed an initial contract but that might change and expand and we're kind of baking that in to say here are the other pieces that we need. So doing it part of the contract negotiation process. I think uh, this is a, a conversation I was having uh, with David at lunch, actually. One of the advantages of having an open source hub around which all of your tools are integrated is that it can help to keep vendors honest. Rather than having an all-in-one solution where the vendor is in, essentially in charge with what they provide, you can play vendors off against each other to some extent and say, well, we've got, you know, we've got this other tool that we could use, uh, then they're going to do this for us. What, what can you do? Uh, and it leaves you in some uh, control as the, uh, as the customer because you have other alternatives uh, and your basic L, uh, LMS can fulfill the needs probably of 85% of the faculty.
Yeah, so the question, can you just say the question again? Uh, yeah, the the, there's lots of different committees mentioned. And I just wondered how, I mean, coordinating committees takes a long time and so on. Are there lots of people or is it just a handful or, you know, how does all that kind of work? The secret is we're all on the same, uh, it's the same people on all of the different committees. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's only, that's partially true, but not, not greatly. I'd say there's a core of, of five or six people who are on multiple committees in the process. But um, the user advisory group, um, we have probably, over the course of the year, maybe 20 people will have attended some meetings of it, depending on what they're interested in. The average attendance at a meeting, 10 to 15, uh, I would say. Uh, the digital learning environment group includes uh, uh, representatives from all of the different units, uh, and that would probably be what, 15 or 20 people of whom, you know, again, maybe 10 will come to, uh, to an average meeting. Um, and the Instructional Technology Subcommittee is probably the largest. Uh, there are, what, 40-something, 50-something instructional technologists spread across uh, the university, and they, time's up, they probably uh, have the hardest uh, job getting a, a, a large number of representatives to come to any one meeting. Thanks. Thank you, and that's our time. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody.